Okay, let's start then. So we don't have uh, too much empty space at the beginning of the recording. Um, my name is Ildiko Vancha. I'm also working for the OpenStack Foundation. And I would like to welcome you all on this uh, community meeting. Uh, this is basically a new um, meeting series. And um, uh, the goal of this series is basically to give an opportunity for projects to give updates and demos on the work that they are doing. Um, this is a completely open forum and we are um, actively looking for people to contribute and present their work. So um, if you're interested in um, being up on stage on any of the upcoming uh, occasions of this meeting, then please reach out to my colleague Chris Hodge or basically anyone from the foundation who you have the um, contact info to and then we will make sure to get you up on the schedule. Another thing that we have is uh, a community uh, newsletter that you can sign up for. Um, I threw the um, link to the sign up page uh, into the chat. So if you're interested, please check it out and uh, go and sign up. Uh, on, the, on the today's call, um, we are introducing one of the uh, new uh, top level pilot projects of the OpenStack Foundation. It's called Starling X. Uh, this project is uh, a new software stack, um, basically for edge computing and IoT use cases. Uh, it integrates um, together a lot of well-known open source components from OpenStack services to Linux, Kubernetes, OBS, DPDK, and so forth. And it also adds some new services focusing on uh, important things such as high performance, low latency, high availability, everything that's important for, for Edge and IoT. And the team is also getting the first release out this week. and. Um, it is also a growing community, so I would like to encourage everyone on the call that if you're interested after hearing more about the, the project and the project team and the community, if you're interested to participate, um, please do so. We have a website for the project starting x.io uh, with all the information that you need to know in order to be able to get started. Also, don't be shy to um, ask questions. And uh, as we have um, two people on the call being way more knowledgeable than I am, I would like to give the word to Bruce Johns and Ian Choliff to um, share more details with you about starting X. Okay, can we uh, see the slides on the line here? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna roll through here and hopefully uh, my friend Bruce can uh, join us back uh, in flight here shortly. So um, uh, my name is Ian Jolliff, um, one of the members of the Starling X community and a member of the technical steering committee of uh, the Starling X project. So as Ildiko was saying, uh, we're launching uh, Starling X officially with our first uh, release uh, this week. And uh, it's a new top level pilot project of uh, the OpenStack Foundation. We're really excited to be sharing with you today all the, the great capabilities that this project uh, brings to the table, providing high performance, low latency, and really a small footprint for uh, critical edge applications uh, and solutions today. Uh, certainly looking forward to growing the community. We've got uh, a large community already established, but lots of interesting technologies uh, for people to contribute to and uh, uh, grow the code base and uh, extend the promise of edge computing and uh, cloud computing in general. So really excited to be here today and share uh, the community aspects and also the technology. So from a, a project uh, perspective, uh, there's a number of technologies and trends uh, in the uh, computing industry today uh, as Application move, applications move closer to the edge or require higher performance at the edge, whole new uh, requirements are coming forth for things like autonomous driving, IoT in, uh, in communities, uh, mass transit, and really bringing latency, high bandwidth to these applications because 
more and more data is being generated uh, closer to uh, the edge of the network and it's really not uh, practical to backhaul it all but we need low latency high bandwidth at the edge to, to deliver that uh, solution. In addition, uh, we need to build in security because uh, whereas typical cloud solutions are in a, a physically secure data center, many of, the, many of these edge applications uh, will be in uh, less secure locations at the edge of the network. Uh, in terms of the use cases that uh, this community is exploring, uh, VRAN, so virtual radio access networks, is certainly a, a very interesting uh, use case, uh, providing the capabilities to uh, serve up uh, high bandwidth, low latency to uh, um, the uh, baseband units as well as uh, the radios. So really providing that, that linkage and providing a virtualization layer to really radically transform and provide application consolidation at the edge of the network to really uh, enable other use cases like uh, multi-access edge computing where we're bringing uh, virtual reality, augmented reality uh, to the table uh, along with the radio network and uh, tying that into things like connected vehicles as well. From an industrial perspective, uh, for healthcare, we've got uh, some really interesting uh, use cases for uh, imaging and diagnostics. How, how can uh, uh, we improve the patient experience and the um, uh, clinician's experience in terms of having all the data available to them uh, seamlessly, transparently, and being able to have a, a really informed dialogue with the patient and uh, uh, in a very secure way within a, a healthcare facility? Uh, some more use cases, so if you think about an autonomous car and how that uh, concept applies to some other uh, transportation modalities, uh, certainly rail is a, a very interesting uh, use case where um, in a uh, freight train there's a, a huge uh, amount of momentum behind uh, the freight train, so uh, being able to adapt the environment ar around it and uh, provide security for uh, people that are operating in and around the train uh, through uh, uh, camera analytics and uh, really transforming a locomotive into a, a rolling data center. Same thing in a ship. So a ship has uh, got a huge amount of uh, uh, data going through it and uh, uh, being able to leverage and consolidate all of that information and optimize uh, the fuel burn in a uh, ship, for example. Um, also seeing applications where uh, we're joining the uh, uh, HMIs, so the uh, human interface into uh, automation and controls uh, for uh, virtualizing programmable logical controllers as well as providing full digital twins of control systems for simulating and uh, and doing analysis of very complex control systems and really taking that to a, an edge cloud in, a, in an air-gapped environment uh, is critically important. Uh, from a, a micro CPE uh, perspective, again, uh, bringing content delivery, SD-WAN, and all these solutions together where you've perhaps got a hierarchy of of clouds with some centralized uh, cloud with uh, again distributed uh, distributed control uh, solutions for providing uh, content delivery at the edge of the network. So what what problems is uh, Starling X solving today? Um, certainly we're seeing uh, a, uh, a need to drive compute to the edge uh, to do all this processing and minimizing the backhaul. Um, it's really uh, changing a cloud computing uh, architecture challenge, which initially started with uh, driving up the scale of uh, computing and providing uh, mobility of applications within a data center into a massively distributed data center that is uh, a, a really a, a hugely interesting classic uh, distributed computing architecture that is going to require new ar uh, new approaches and new solutions. And that, that's the thing that excites me about Starling X is how do we uh, attack and uh, overcome some of these uh, really interesting uh, distributed computing uh, uh, architecture challenges. So um, really 
the intent of this project is to reconfigure and take uh, the, the foundational elements of uh, cloud technologies, build on top of the outstanding work that the OpenStack community has been doing for, for many years now and see how we can take these technologies and uh, distribute them geographically and uh, drive uh, the adoption of edge computing and really bring forward some of these transformational use cases that we've been talking about so far uh, this morning. So we really want to uh, drive down the friction because uh, of adoption of these technologies. Uh, cloud computing is uh, uh, maturing, but still uh, not super easy to adopt. And as you drive these uh, uh, technologies to the edge of the network, we need to lower the friction, make it easy to manage and deploy all these, uh, all these great technologies. So let me talk a little bit about the, the stack uh, that the community has built and uh, where we're going with some of the, uh, these technologies. So we've built a very scalable and uh, deployment ready solution. Uh, obviously we build on top of uh, a, Linux, uh, a Linux OS, uh, bring together uh, technologies like uh, KVM, uh, Open vSwitch, DPDK, uh, Ceph and others to build a, a solid compute stack infrastructure. So we build on top of Linux. Uh, KVM is the primary hy hypervisor of this project. Um, we layer in uh, OVS along with uh, DPDK, so the OVS DPDK pro uh, uh, project for virtual switching, and uh, and then layer in. Uh, OpenStack services for the, the cloud control plane. So we're leveraging projects like Nova, Neutron, uh, Keystone, Ironic, uh, Cinder, Glance, Heat, uh, Swift, Murano, and the uh, telemetry family of projects like uh, uh, Panko, for example. And uh, last but not least, uh, obviously the Horizon GUI is also available as part of this project. Uh, there's an additional set of uh, projects that Starling X is managing in the Starling X repos, and uh, I'll, I'll go into more detail about uh, some of these in the subsequent slides, but I'll touch on all of them at this point. So uh, config management is all about uh, managing and deploying uh, the services to uh, the various nodes within the system. Uh, fault management is all, all about uh, monitoring and recovering uh, faults that may be in this uh, very small edge cloud, uh, being able to provide uh, REST APIs to be able to query what faults are where in the system, as well as uh, providing uh, traditional interfaces um, for some telecom use cases for things like SNMP. Host management allows us to uh, um, manage all the hosts in, uh, in these clouds, uh, monitor the services that are going on them and uh, take them in and out of service so that we can actually do some uh, maintenance on them as well. Again, uh, as we get to the edge of the network, uh, there's less less touch available and uh, big barriers to uh, actually rolling a truck to go and uh, manage these uh, remote hosts. Service management is uh, an overall maintenance framework that allows us to monitor the health of every individual software process on the system, asynchronously um, recover any of uh, those uh, services that may, uh, may have uh, issues with them and uh, seamlessly recover them and get them back into service without impacting the, the operation of the cloud. Uh, last, lastly, uh, software management is all about uh, how do you uh, make sure that uh, your, your cloud is running uh, the latest and greatest software, so being able to upgrade from uh, one release of another of this uh, curated stack of uh, projects, as well as a, a framework that allows uh, rapid deployment of uh, fixes to any uh, CVEs that may be in the cloud or uh, bug fixes or, or uh, bulk changes to uh, the infrastructure uh, within this cloud, cloud context as well. So one of the things that Starling X is particularly interesting about is, you know, a traditional OpenStack clouds are typically deployed in uh, in data centers at very large scale. 
since we're focusing on the edge, we have to really focus on the on the footprint. So we have three main topologies that we're able to deploy: a single uh, hyper-converged uh, single server solution, where all the uh, compute services, the cloud control plane, and storage services run on a single node, along with VMs. Um, we scale that up into a one-for-one -one protected pair of uh, servers where um, this is a critical infrastructure application and uh, uh, the, uh, the user wants to be able to uh, be uh, redundant from any hardware level failures as well. So that's the next scaling point. Uh, on the far right hand side, we have uh, the multiple server uh, configuration where there's a, a top of rack switch, um, dedicated uh, controllers for the uh, uh, OpenStack services and Starling X services for the cloud control plane, uh, dedicated storage nodes. And this really allows uh, much, much more scalability. And uh, a variation of this uh, is also where uh, we would have a centralized uh, cloud control plane and um, uh, remote hyper-converged nodes where you're able to um, have managed those across a geographically uh, a distributed set of uh, sites as well. So, but it all provides a single uh, pane of glass to the uh, the cloud operator. So, drilling down into some of the services at the next level of detail, as I touched on, uh, configuration management is about managing and installing uh, the initial cluster, but also uh, making it really easy to add uh, new nodes to the cluster and manage all the uh, all the configuration through. Uh, a, uh, a declarative framework. It also allows us to uh, provide new nodes that are added to the cluster with personalities. So is the new node a, a storage node, a compute node, or, or some other uh, function. Um, as we talk about higher and higher performance uh, solutions, uh, the inventory disco discovery allows us to configure uh, and provide uh, visibility into uh, the huge page configuration for uh, for memory configuration for very high performance applications as well. Also making uh, things visible like GPUs and uh, 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 crypto cryptographic uh, accelerators as well. On the host management side, um, we're able to uh, manage and uh, deliver the full life cycle management of the host. So. Uh, bring a, a host online, but then bring it in service, and uh, then be also able to monitor if it does fail, and then uh, use that information to migrate uh, VMs to uh, to active nodes and things like that. So very critical during uh, the management phase of uh, and the upgrading phase of the uh, the cluster as well. Uh, host management also provides a framework uh, where uh, board management. Uh, uh, BMCs are available uh, to do out-of-band out of uh, activities like power on, off, also provide visibility into the cluster in terms of any uh, hardware sensors, thermal, fan, uh, again, gives a, a next layer down of visibility into the infrastructure and allow uh, a recovery and maintenance actions to, uh, to take place, and all through an easy-to-use uh, REST API. Software management is uh, a, a great framework that allows people to uh, deploy corrective content or uh, security vulnerability uh, fixes out to out to these clouds. Uh, be able to um, uh, manage and uh, 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 automated uh, do, use an automated framework to roll through a full cluster, so you're able to. Uh, add a patch to uh, the controllers, and then through a programmatic interface, the system will automatically upgrade all the hosts, uh, migrate uh, VMs around the cluster uh, to minimize the impact uh, on the running applications. So uh, it looks at uh, the available resources and uh, uses live migration to seamlessly migrate, seamlessly migrate uh, these workloads around. Again, we use the same framework to do uh, uh, upgrades from one, uh, well, well, we will do that in future future releases of Starling X, uh, where we'll be able to migrate uh, from one release to uh, another, 
and uh, be able to do this in a seamless way so that the, the framework can be leveraged to uh, uh, do this in an automated way so you're not uh, tying up uh, operators with uh, a lot of uh, keyboard work to uh, migrate through uh, all the hosts and get them up and running to a, a, new, uh, a new release of Starling X. So very interesting uh, framework that allows people to do some, some pretty cool things in terms of making sure the, the security of the, the cluster is up to date and uh, operating optimally. So that, that's a bit about some of the, the frameworks and technologies uh, we're leveraging today, uh, what Starling X brings to the table in terms of additional services and how it all fits together into a, an easy to use and seamless framework for, um, for the edge. Um, I'd like to move on and talk a little bit about where we're taking the technology and uh, enabling some uh, really interesting new and uh, exciting technologies that are uh, around in the industry. So uh, we're really turning the stack on its head uh, in some ways. Um, the community is working on uh, today uh, containerizing all the OpenStack services to uh, make it even easier to uh, deploy and manage uh, with a zero touch provisioning uh, framework along with a declarative framework, leveraging projects like OpenStack Helm, um, obviously uh, having a local Docker registry and running uh, uh, Kubernetes services to manage all the, uh, all the containers as well. Uh, the, uh, initially, the Starling X services will uh, run on uh, bare metal, but our, our view is the architecture will evolve and uh, those services will also migrate uh, uh, to containers. Uh, with service management, which is monitoring uh, the underlying, uh, uh, all the underlying software processes, uh, you know, we'll have to uh, figure out some interesting ways to uh, manage that uh, in a container. So uh, again, some really interesting problems as we move to a more of a con uh, container centric environment and really allows us to do a, a lot of flexibil flexibility in terms of quickly adding uh, new services. So if, uh, if a user wanted to deploy and configure a new service, uh, they'd be able to update uh, a declarative framework and then uh, deploy that in a very uh, cloud native kind of way. And you know, we're really taking uh, these concepts to the edge of the network again, focusing on making sure we have a very small footprint for the solution and uh, uh, making sure that this fits in one and two node configurations and then scales up into uh, uh, a distributed edge cloud configuration. Um, we're using uh, Calico is the initial networking plugin, uh, bringing Ceph to the forefront and uh, leveraging Helm and uh, other, other uh, projects here. So we're really broadening out of the, the ecosystem. Um, this will provide you know, continued full support for virtual machines and building on, uh, on the container support that's present in, uh, in the current release for applications. Uh, but also taking it to the next step where we're containerizing all the uh, uh, Starling X and OpenStack services uh, in the future. So a really in interesting and exciting part of Starling X and really encourage people to uh, join us and uh, uh, bring their ideas to uh, this exciting uh, next generation technology. So, so this really, uh, helps accelerate the adoption of uh, edge technology. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of building blocks out there that people can make choices on. Starling X helps uh, accelerate that by uh, providing some choices and uh, uh, building together a full stack solution that people can deploy. Uh, that's been tested and, and ready to use for people today. Um, so I'm going to pause here and see if uh, Bruce has been able to join us or I will. I am on. here. Can you hear me? All right. Me? I can hear you, Bruce. Over to you, my friend. Okay. Um, computers are such fun. So um, next slide, please. So uh, we're very, very proud and happy to be um, part of the OpenStack Foundation and part of the OpenStack community. And we're fully committed to the four opens of software development. We look for our technical contributors to make all of the technical decisions um, under the guidance of our technical steering committee, which I'll talk about in a minute. 
We're committed to building a diverse, open, and strong community. Next slide, please. So this is actually a fairly large project. And in order to help us manage the complexity and to um, you know, kind of reduce the scope of what people have to think about as they're working on it, uh, we've divided the project up into a number of sub-projects. Um, each of the services that Ian has been describing for you today is its own project. Uh, they are um, slightly dependent on each other right now, and we're working to reduce that dependency. In support of those main projects, we have a number of other sub-projects um, for documentation, for test, for release, for security. We also, um, as part of the build, we include um, a number of open source packages, and so we have sub-projects that help us manage those life cycles. We're constantly scanning for updates from the upstream packages for fixes, uh, CVEs, and et cetera. Um, each of the sub-project teams has a lead, a team lead, a project lead. They will have a, a number of core reviewers and, of course, contributors. And I'll talk about all of those on the next slide. So we've borrowed a lot of our governance from um, both the OpenStack community and the Kata containers community. Um, We've done some really um, pioneering work and really good work in defining how to run a, a well-run open source project. So we're, we're calling a contributor someone who's made a contribution in the past 12 months. And anyone who is a contributor um, can um, run for and vote for the elected positions. That includes the TSC and all of the leadership roles that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, a contribution can be code, it can be test, it can be documentation. Um, we're trying to keep this um, simple and automated, so we really look in the Garrett queues and see who's contributed, and then if needed, um, the TSC can um, provide contributor status for people who've made other contributions to the project that don't necessarily show up in Garrett. We're also using the concept of a core reviewer. These are active contributors and experts in a particular technology area. They're appointed by their fellow core reviewers. Their main responsibility is for reviewing changes and specifications, and the cores have the ability to uh, merge changes into the Garrett tree. The next slide, please. So we've, we've split the traditional OpenStack PTL role into two separate roles in Starling X. So we have a technical lead per sub-project that sets the technical direction for that particular sub-project. We also have a project lead who's doing the coordination work and the tracking and the communication and serves as kind of an outside facing ambassador to the project. And we're doing this uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that we've been blessed with the people on the, on the teams who can fill these roles and Second reason is, is that um, there's a specialty of skills. So people that are good at project level work aren't necessarily strong technical people. People that are the strong technical people aren't always good at the um, project level work. So it's a way for us to optimize the team and, and to let people work on what, uh, where their skills are best suited. Next slide, please. So overall, the project is managed and led by our technical steering committee. They're responsible for the architecture of the project, for um, approving new sub-projects, for archiving sub-projects that are no longer needed or no longer active. It's also the place where the buck stops and any final decisions or escalations or disagreements with the team can be resolved in the technical steering committee. The current governments, governance uh, says that this will be seven people. The initial group will be appointed, that we will move to an election-based system within the first year of the project. The initial members are Brent, Ian, uh, Dean, and Saul. Let's go on. So there's lots of places you can start looking at. Um, our code is available in Git Garrett. We have a wiki that contains um, informal documentation. We are in the process 
of moving that documentation into the um, the uh, a document documentation repository where it can be web accessible. If you go to starlingx.io today, you can start seeing the results of that. I'm very, very pleased with the work that our documentation team has done in moving the content off of the wiki and into the formal track documents. We're tracking our bugs in Launchpad. We're tracking our stories in Storyboard. And we're, we have a specs repository where you can see um, the currently active and approved specifications that the team is working on. Next slide, please. So you do not need to be a member of the OpenStack Foundation in order to contribute. Um, but if you'd like a vote in the uh, Foundation Board of Directors election, you probably would want to join. I strongly encourage people to join the foundation. It's a pretty cool place. If you're contributing on behalf of an employer, then please make sure your employer has signed a corporate contributor license agreement. Next, please. So uh, we have a free note channel, we have mailing lists, we have email, we have uh, weekly calls. We actually, each of the sub teams has a weekly call. Um, the overall project has a weekly call. The TSC has a weekly call. We encourage everyone on this uh, webinar and anyone who may watch it later to feel free to join our mailing list, uh, check us out on IRC. Um, welcome to have you attend the weekly calls. And thank you very much. We're happy to take any questions that you have. Thanks, Ian and Bruce. Uh, I see questions in, in the chat, so I will start with reading in those. And then if anyone else has questions, then um, either type it up on the chat or just ask it after these two are answered. So the first one is from Andrew. Um, he's saying footprint consideration is key as mentioned. What the actual memory requirements for a single server deployment and what are the system CPU needs? So the, uh, the memory footprint would be dependent on the number of uh, VMs that uh, somebody would want to deploy. So it would be not just the platform infrastructure, but you'd have to take into account the, uh, the amount of memory. Um, depending on the number of VMs uh, that people would want to run, uh, we have some recommendations in terms of anywhere from uh, 32 gig to 64 is, is typically what we, what we see um, in terms of um, CPU footprint, uh, we can uh, fit the uh, base services in a one and a two uh, um, node configuration into into two physical cores. So a very, very small footprint. Okay, I guess the question was, was um, obviously the number of application VMs determines the amount of memory and CPU for applications clearly, um, but the question was more about the system overhead. Right, so, so in terms on the of memory. On the CPU side, it's one to two cores. Okay, and the, the memory? Uh, again, it depends on the number of uh, uh, VMs that you want to manage and what services you're running. But, uh, you know, sort of guidance we give is 32 gig. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, well, two questions are from Phil. Um, he's asking about the uh, first target use case uh, you are looking for. So there's some natural use cases for Starling X. Um, there's a number of uh, telco use cases. Um, if you think about putting edge servers at the base of cell phone towers and be able to manage those remotely those kinds of use cases are fairly natural. We also think that there's um, a number of use cases around um, factory automation and industrial deployments where moving um, computing resources closer to the manufacturing line and doing more processing closer to the manufacturing line can benefit the, the overall manufacturing process. Thanks. The 
the next question is um, again from Phil. Um, he says, I understand the technical details are based on OpenStack and containers and there are similar projects to this. And he's asking about uh, the differences with other Mac projects. So I'm probably not the best person to talk about other mech projects. I'm not sure what, what projects he means. Um, Phil, are you there? Can you maybe clarify the question? So I'll, I'll go ahead and try to answer anyways. I think the, the, the value proposition here is in um, a couple areas. Um, one is the the new unique services that Starling X provides that simplify the manageability and the upgradability and the overall maintenance of the platform. And the second is is that this the system is validated and tested as an entire stack. So the components have been optimized and tuned and validated together. Um, to ensure that they all work and can be easily deployed. So should we move on to the question from Mark about the integration with Starling X and Nova? Yep. So I'll, I'll take a shot at that and Ian may jump in. Um, there are a number of changes out of tree changes to Nova in Starling X. We are actively engaged with the Nova community to um, get those upstreamed, get them accepted by the Nova community or re-engineered in Starling X to align with Nova. We're actually at the PTG, we had really good sessions with Nova, with Neutron, with several other OpenStack um, related projects. Uh, the Starling X team is working very hard to reduce the patch backlog um, that we are carrying right now. It's very important for us. It's very important for the community. We're down by um, a third of uh, the OpenStack related patches since we started the project. So we're making ongoing and continued progress to address the, uh, the delta between Starling X and the upstream masters. Yeah, and I, I would add at the PTG in Denver, uh, there was a great dialogue with the Nova Nova community. Um, you know, there are a number of specs uh, that we've contributed to the uh, uh, Nova project, and they're under dis under review uh, by the the Nova team right now. And you know that that will continue uh, the collaboration with Nova team, and you know, looking to accelerate uh, those review cycles. So. There are people on the call to uh, who are interested in that. Uh, please, please get on and uh, promote promote the reviews that that uh, you see there. Happy to happy to get input from folks. Sorry, if I could add uh, follow on to that. Do we have an idea of a timeline for what release these might be landing in? Well, I think that depends on. Uh, the adoption of these other projects. So we've got to work into their existing work work queues and and uh, backlogs. So you know there's there's a lot of review cycles that go on. So it's something that we're actively working uh, release over release. So there's there's specs and and changes submitted to Stein already across several of the OpenStack projects and. Everything we want won't go into Stein. So it'll go into uh, whatever comes after Stein. Excellent, thank you. So um, who do we contact to create a proof of concept? Um, you can contact the community on our mailing list. You can reach out to me directly. You can reach out to uh, Ian directly. Either one of us would uh, be more than happy to help um, with any proof of concepts of Starling X. Ian, can you talk about the uh, GPU question? I, I don't have the details on that. Yeah, so uh, the uh, the approach right now is 
is to leverage the GPU pass-through uh, capability and also um, work with vendors in an open way to uh, have a V uh, GPU, so virtual uh, GPU capability. And uh, uh, those vendors are working on some of those technologies, so it's really a vendor, vendor agnostic approach. Um, I am aware of community members who have uh, done, done work with NVIDIA and others, and like Intel, for example, as well. So I'll take the Acrano question. Um, what is the relationship and roadmap vis-a-vis -vis Acrano and Starling X? So um, both uh, both Intel and Wind River have representatives on the uh, Acrano Technical Steering Committee. We're very much a part of the process. Uh, I'm part of the Acrano community myself. Um, there are blueprints that are being submitted for Starling X within the Acrano community. Um, there's work within um, both communities to try to align in general. The, uh, the plans that Ian discussed for containerization include using Airship, which is um, part of the Acrano stack that AT&T is, is defining in their blueprints. So. I think the answer to the question, the short answer is um, the communities overlap and, and there's several of us that are part of both. Yeah, I'm also a member of the Acrino community and, and uh, you know, it, it's a community that's evolving and uh, we, we plan on uh, continuing our, our work in that community and making sure there is good alignment between Starling X and uh, Acrino. Okay, so the question on the state of OS abstraction is something we're just starting to work on. Um, it's a very large effort. Um, the software updating, um, software upgrades that Ian described uh, right now need abstraction layers built into them in order to handle other package file formats. Uh, validating on a new OS, uh, maintaining a additional OS. Every OS we add to the project multiplies the validation effort. So we're looking at, but we're very much looking at um, moving in this direction. We have uh, a sub project created uh, called the multi OS sub project for addressing those issues and working on them. And it's all being actively worked in the community right now. Yeah, I think it's uh, really important to highlight that the multi OS project is uh, just getting started and you know providing that layer of abstraction that uh, Bruce mentioned is is what that sub team is focused on and uh, you know we're looking for uh, expertise and contributions from other other groups and other um, Linux variants to uh, help this multi OS project uh, provide that abstraction so that we can uh, provide that base OS flexibility to uh, Starling X uh, users and developers. We're also working hard to make the services more independent so they can be used in other ways and other systems. There's a lot of value in the technology that's, that's been open sourced here and we're hoping to see that value fully realized. Other questions? seems that all the questions are answered. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you again, Bruce and Ian, for the amazing presentation. Um, for those of you who are interested, um, there are a lot of links uh, in the Zoom chat, uh, including the, uh, the website startingx.io. 
the website contains all the links uh, that you would possibly want to have like to the code, the documentation, uh, communication channels such as uh, mailing list and IRC channel. So if you have further questions, please reach out to the community and uh, ask them on the mailing list or on IRC. Um, this uh, meeting is also recorded, so we will post uh, the recording to the website as well uh, once it's available. So you will be able to um, listen to that. And I also mentioned that there is a community newsletter that you can sign up for. Uh, the link for that is also um, in the chat as well. Um, and with uh, that, I would like to thank you all for uh, participating um, and uh, see you all on the next webinar slash community meeting. Yeah, and everybody, thanks. This is Chris Hodge from the OpenStack Foundation, and I want to thank everybody for, for, for joining us. Um, this is kind of our second big community meeting. Um, for the first few of these, we're actually doing them at a very high level. The previous week's meeting was about um, project governance. Um, if you follow the link to the Etherpad in there, you can, you can see the, the, the slides to that, to that meeting. Um, the first few of these meetings are probably going to be a little bit higher level, but as we move on, I really want to encourage everybody within the entire OpenStack Foundation community across all of the strategic areas to um, contribute, um, you know, talk about exciting things that you're working on and, uh, you know, really make this, this meeting about, um, you know, kind of showing, you know, sharing with the entire community the work that we're doing. Um, so thank you for everybody who, who came to this meeting. And if you would like to contribute to a future meeting, um, please feel free to, to contact me at, at chris at openstack.org. Thanks. And with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll uh, call an end to the meeting.